Okay, it says we are live. So to anybody joining us now, or who'll be joining us some point in the future, um, whether it's tomorrow or a hundred years from now, um, welcome to the Era One Lit Salon. Um, my name is Marty. I am the marketing and publicity guy with Air One Books. Uh, thank you for showing up tonight. We have a wonderful evening ahead of us. We have Hannah Abigail Clark, uh, and as well as Zoraida Cordova, uh, reading and hanging out and having a conversation, answering Q and A's um, to your heart's content. Um, it's currently six forty-five Eastern Standard Time, so we'll start around seven. Um, so hang tight until then. I will probably be rambling myself for the next couple of minutes. Um, if you are watching this, if you are planning on watching it later, um, if you have anybody, anybody watching it live, um, you will notice that we have comments activated. So if you have any comments, any questions, um, anything that you want uh, Clark or Zoraida to um, answer later, um, please put it in the chat. And thank you for joining us. And for anybody interested, a little fun fact, the last two that we did, I've tried to wear a book centric shirt uh, the last couple of times we did this. So the first digital lit salon, I believe I wore my books are magic t-shirt. And then the last salon we did, I'd wore a print bookstore t-shirt. Um, so print bookstores up in Maine. Uh, and today I'm wearing a book moon t-shirt from our good friends, book moon in uh, Massachusetts run by Kelly link and Gavin Grant. Book moon is great. Go support your indies. Um, and it looks like Clark is here. So I'm going to add in. Hey, hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine. Just talking to the masses, folks who are joining us. Hello, masses. Hello, masses. We have five people so far, and we still have about 10, 15 minutes until we get rocking and rolling. Um, so yeah, welcome. How's it going? That's going well. How are you? I'm good. You are on, you are on day three of of launch events yeah heck yeah that's yeah. wonderful it's i was nerding out earlier about the history of blonde lesbians from ohio and literary salons um mm -hmm. and now like clifford barney so <laughs> <laughs> is it a long and storied history yeah actually that's awesome uh, yeah uh Natalie Clifford Barney, basically everyone who was writing in Paris in like the 1920s, 30s, uh, hung out at her place for her literary salons. Cool. Well, mm -hmm. it sounds like we're sounds like we're continuing in a in a grand tradition. I'll take it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm just going to tweet tweet out and let folks know that we're live. Um, but for the folks who are here so far, thank you for, for joining. Thank you for being here. Oh, um, Clark, it looks like your big idea is live on uh, Mr. Jonathan Scalzi's big idea on their website. Oh, wow. So yeah, it looks like it was just done though. So, or rather later in the afternoon. So I'll be sure to tweet that out and let folks know about that. Ah, look who we have here, adding to the stream. This is Zoraida Cordova. Well, howdy. Hi. Thank you for joining us. How's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. Just uh, setting everything up here and getting technical and all that fun stuff. Yeah. I feel like the camera is inverted. So, like, it is inverted. My so hair part screen. is just so weird. <laughs> I, me too. But like, before the camera, before I started recording, I was like, <sighs> yeah. Nothing was working. So, I don't know if that's meant to uh, help you or or make it easier, but it is weird. It's weirdly inverted here, but it'll be okay on the YouTube uh, uh, video when it comes out. Okay. I was trying to resist the curl in the middle of my forehead situation that my hair loves to do, and I just just go with it. There's nothing I can do about Ooh, it. There is a 
I'm gonna just is it is it better to address the dad energy? Because there's a there's a Clark Kent joke here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I have a dimple chin, so <laughs> sure. Okay, so it fits. It fits. Um, well, awesome. I'm just going to let the folks know. Are you drinking from a chalice? <gasps> I am. So cool. This is my chalice. Fantastic. Amazing. I found it in a garage sale. And I was like, this is mine. I polish it every now and then, but I just, I ran out of silver polish. <laughs> that's, that's mood. <laughs> Thank you for bringing big chalice. I thought it would energy. be, yeah, I thought it would be appropriate for today's reading. Mm, I mean, I wore this because this is my vampire shirt, so. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I haven't read from this yet, so I'm excited. Yes, I'm so excited to hear, uh, hear this new story. Plus it's like a minute per page that's what people say right mm -hmm. i think so yeah about okay oh clark kayla okay. kayla burson says that she loves your shirt feels very on brand for escape creatures reading thank you i appreciate that i'm okay can we see the comments on the youtube uh yeah so let's see i can i can show them here <laughs> on the screen, which is fun. Um, and then we we also have a private chat if we want to talk uh, behind the people's backs. Um, <laughs> just I'm like, case. BRB, some, I get random deliveries of things that I forgot that I ordered at 8 p.m. because it's New York and they deliver until midnight. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so if there's a loud buzzing, it's just me trying to scramble out of this little corner that I've made for myself. No worries, all good. I, I have, I, my normal apartment is in Astoria, so I've gotten the like the buzz at like nine PM and you're you hear like the brief like Amazon or like UPS and it's like oh all right, guess we're doing this. Yeah. And the is words there, Okay, so we're doing this. Is there a, a looming face over your shoulder? Hmm? Me? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh that's baby Yoda. <gasps> baby Yoda. Oh. And that's really Joey Tribi reading. that's Joey Tribbiani. <laughs> From friends. I thought it looked like Joey. Haunting. My, it is haunting. My brother gave it to me. Um, I don't know if it's better with his eyes blurred oh. out or not. <laughs> it's like Terminator 2. <laughs> like liquid metal Joey. Oh. <laughs> haunting. Ooh, we're not the only people drinking from a chalice today. That's excellent. Good. Yay. Yay. Oh, oh, man. I should not have moved that quickly. My shoulder's still messed up. Oh, no. What happened? <laughs> um, I don't know what I did to it. Uh, oh, so no. it might be a torn something or a yeah. nerve thing. Um, oh, joy. Even more fun. Not good at all. I'm sorry. Oh, no. But I got an MRI this afternoon, this morning, and my doctor, um, my doctor, calls me like he's like are you claustrophobic and i was like i guess we're gonna find out <laughs> <laughs> and i wasn't so that was good. Well, good it's always funny when you learn new things about yourself as that thing is happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like there was a um there was a moment last winter when a bunch of salt had gotten into the various grates of new york city and there were like fires electrical fires happening underneath various manholes throughout the boroughs and I never knew that I'd be the kind of person that be good in an emergency. Um, and then the manhole cover in front of my building exploded and we found out there was a bunch of um, like CO2 and like other horrible shit in the, in the air in my apartment. And I saw the explosion and I went, while at Keys, put, roommate, put your shoes on, we're going right now. And I like went into action mode. And then only after I was like, huh, I guess I am good in a crisis. Weird that it took a crisis to find out, but there you are. Yeah, you know, it's just those moments, those things that you just find out That's... then and there. I should have my water ready. Marty, you're stronger than me. When there was almost that turn, I mean, there was there were tornadoes in Chicago recently. Um, it didn't touch down in my particular neighborhood, but I was definitely just looking out the window like, I'm not going downstairs. I'm on the third floor, but I'm not going downstairs until I see a cloud. No, I'm not putting on shoes. It's wet outside. No, like mm. I have to. Midwestern brain has to be really, really upset about tornadoes before I, I move. And that's not good survival instincts. That's not. <laughs> it's weird when your survival instincts are overridden by the fact that you're like, this is a nuisance. I don't want to be doing this. 
<laughs> Inconvenience. <laughs> that is fair. Okay, so we got some more folks coming in. And I've put it online that we're live. And of course, um, for anybody who's just joining us or anybody who's going to be watching this later on sometime in the future, either now or in 100 years, um, this is being recorded. So um, you can watch this at any time. Um, you can probably skip ahead unless you want to hear our lovely banter. Um, the reading will reading will probably, will probably start in the next five, 10 minutes. We're still waiting on uh, the wonderful publisher uh, and admiral captain of uh, the good ship Erewhon, Liz Garinsky, who will be hosting tonight. I am just your humble publicity marketing man who sets this up. But an unseen shadow. <laughs> how has your uh, how has your launch week been, Clark? It's been uh, good, very surreal, um, but but good. I've been I... sorry. Oh, I'm here. I'm still accessorizing <laughs> frantically, but I have oh, stuff on my wall. I, I love that you. we have all gone uh, vampire vampire chic, witchy oh, vampire witchy chic. Did I forget you on the memo, Marty? I I am um, the tourist in the vampire story that doesn't know what's going on. You're um, the one who gets bitten. I'm the Ooh. I'm the hapless victim, and that's, <laughs> and that's okay because uh, I'm repping a rhino button down, but also Book Moon um, from of, with, with Kelly Link and Gavin Grant's uh, fame. So I don't you mind. Could a, you could just be a techno pagan. Thank you. That's exactly the plan. I've seen the What We Do in the Shadows TV series, Marty. Yes. Yep. Oh, no, Marty. Newest season. Do I have big Guillermo energy? Because that's fine, too. I, I was going to go with the episode where the one vampire, like, decides he's going to pretend to be a human being in a tower oh, for a while. I have, oh, Jackie. I, yeah, I, Jackie Daytona. I have big, I'll take the, hey, that's a compliment. Matt Berry is a treasure. Um, so thank you. Okay, got one deer. Well, lovely. Ah. The second time people have accessorized or had deer in the, in the <laughs> video of Escape Racers Freedom. That's, that's, uh, where, where did I, oh, right, right, um, Hannah's deer. Yeah. Hannah brought a deer plushie, yeah. which is lovely. This deer is actually compatible with my headphones. Sorry, we still have like three minutes, right? Good. Oh, yeah, yeah, for being so chaotic, I came home and I was like, let me like hang this wall sconce. That's a reasonable thing to do <laughs> with my time. The one behind you? Yes. <laughs> that reminds me that, that reminds me of the episode of Parks and Recreation where uh, Ron Swanson makes two wedding rings out of a sconce. He tears off a wall and Ooh. walks it through the entire steps. He makes, makes two rings like an hour and he's like, buying things is for suckers. <laughs> Making things is easy. <laughs> Making things is special. Exactly. Yeah. I need to hang my sconces. That's a thing for soon. Make my flatmate do it though. They have longer arms than me. <laughs> and you just moved, right, Clark? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this yeah. is a new space. Yeah. This is uh, a new apartment in a different neighborhood of Chicago. Hey. Hey. What neighborhood are you in now? Logan Square. Oh yeah, you like Logan Square. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, putting my phone on silent. <laughs> Somebody asked, can this video be replayed? I'm supposed to be in class right now. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you for skipping class for this. Um, I'm not gonna say that this is more important than your education, but certainly equal to. Um, this is edifying for your supernatural knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is gonna help you street smarts, vampire smarts. Um, for anybody who's just joining us, a uh, quick little plug. We'll get started in a few minutes. I'll get out of here. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have a little Q&A moment um, later on. So you can always pop those in the chat. Um, feel free to comment and, and uh, on stories as they're being read. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you haven't yet RSVP'd, um, we do have our Erewhon community hangout afterward on the Erewhon Discord. It's a brand new thing we're trying out. So uh, please bear with us. Um, and uh, you can always pop on the RSVP list. It's on the Arrow One Twitter account, uh, or just reach out to me directly um, at the info at Arrow One Books Gmail. Um, but yeah, seeing as how it's almost seven, I'm gonna dip out to let uh, y'all superstars enjoy, but I will be here in the background if you need me for anything. Uh, and 
Have a good reading. Thanks so much. Thanks, Marty. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Cool. I guess that means I'm temporarily in charge, um, but I'm going to give it <laughs> one more minute just in case anybody is slightly late joining us. Cool blue lighting. Yeah. I was actually, I was going to make some lighting that was synced to the cover of the book, but that was another thing that I didn't quite get my act together for. <laughs> but. It's fantastic. It's implicit. Also, colored lighting in general is already like on theme. So these are exactly the kind of terrible teenagers who like put color changing LEDs on every surface of of their living space so yeah I just imagine me with like you know a uh, weird LED lighting in my in my parents basement and and we we're beginning to set the scene um Excellent. Um, okay, cool. So Marty did most of the basic intro stuff. I guess at this point you usually say, um, so basic structure will introduce each of the readers, they will read, um, we will um, do some Q&A. Um, feel free to pop your questions in at any time, but we'll probably be mostly looking at the Q&A. Um, I guess actually we'll usually do a few questions after uh, after each reader, though, I'm suddenly realizing it's been a few months since we've done this, and I've lost all sense of uh, like a propriety and structure. So uh, maybe I'll uh, check with Marty and make sure that that's allowed. Um, <laughs> but um, so, um, and then um, towards the end, uh, we will basically after um, after readers have gone, um, we have an optional Zoom community hour for people that want to hang out with the Erwan crew and um, uh, possibly some of our readers and other fans, um, and that is on the Discord. Uh, so I think that if you uh, don't have a link to that yet, uh, you can either email at, uh, us at info at erewanbooks.com or um, uh, fill out the reg form and uh, we might be able to catch that and send you an email, but at this point, just get in however you can. And um, that's where we're going to try meeting from now on. Um, so this used to be, this was a monthly thing for a little over a year. And then um, the pandemic and trying to run a publishing company at the same time got the better of us. And we took a little pause over the summer, but we are super excited to be getting back in the swing of things with this particular reading. Um, coming up, uh, we are not, I think, 100% ready to announce we uh, the upcoming things, but um, we are going to try to be more consistent about this as we are going into the fall and I'm getting our acts together. Um, so we are hoping to have uh, more excellent auditory treats for you and visual treats coming up. Uh, but for now, um, I am really excited to be able to introduce um, uh, this crew in particular because this is um, our first Lit Salon celebrating um, Erwan's uh, first YA book, first hardcover book, and that is The Scapegracers by Hannah Abigail Clark. Um, and so I'm going to start with a quick bio. Uh, Hannah Abigail Clark is here and queer, etc. They've been published in Lunch Ticket, Prism International, Dream Pop Press, Portland Review, Gothic Nature Journal, Eidolon, and Chatelor Magazine. They were a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellow in Young Adult Fiction and a Pushcart nominee. They currently research, well, they, they previously, uh, as of a few months ago, researched queerness, labor, and monstrosity in grad school. The Scapegracers is their first novel. Um, so Clark, you can feel free to take it away from there. Yeah. Uh, so only context you need before this. Uh, Sideways, who is our lesbian witch protagonist, did some magic at a party. And then a mysterious stranger took her upstairs to the deck where they did some more magic and then Sideways blacked out. And the popular girls who had paid her to do the magic at this party have now dragged her downstairs to see the aftermath of what she apparently supposedly did. All right. It was about midnight, maybe after. I was damn sure you'd gone upstairs. It was after the glow stick thing, said Jing. She put her hands on her hips. We were screwing around, having fun. I'll give you this. The glow stick thing was rad. Everyone was majorly impressed, but then the chalk started. No one drew the shapes. They just appeared on their own. I'm not screwing with you. All the drawings just showed up under our feet. Then the music got louder, painfully loud. I had Alexis DJ for us and it busted her speakers. It was so loud. And it wasn't her music either. It switched mid-song. It was this freaky retro doo-wop. It was damn weird sideways. I think it was the Cordettes, said Daisy. It was not the Cordettes, said Jane. So we're all wincing and cussing, and then the lights cut out, all of them. But it wasn't the power, because the music kept playing, and there was light under the door upstairs. We could only see people's hands, the broken glow bracelets, you know? It was wicked cool, hands down, best scare party ever. I can't wait until next weekend. Costumes won't be tacky by then. 
Daisy, impervious to Jing's acid glare, looked monstrously pleased with herself. The chalk drawing slowed too. It was spooky as hell. I'm sure that Austin Grass pissed himself. He was so scared. Serves the bastard right dumping Alexis like that. I filmed it. Jing cleared her nostrils. Last night's mascara had flaked under her eyes and the smudges reminded me of Kitty Skeleton face paint. She pursed her lips. People are still posting about it. It's a pretty big deal. Speculation abounds. You'd be surprised to know how many people are trying to write it off as some trick you learned in drama sideways. As if the ragtag drama club could pull off a stunt like this. Watch it. That's my ragtag drama club you're talking about. I grumbled into the back of my wrist. The Sycamore Gorge West High Drama Club was the most the school had to offer, thanks. I loved it, even if it was shitty and poorly directed, and none of the folks involved were talking to me anymore. I scratched the back of my neck and took a step closer to the wall. A chalk drawing comprised of V's and C's loomed inches from my nose, lines drawn on thick, angles sharp, curves heavy. Holy hell, this is my handwriting. Yeah, I figured. Jen crossed her arms. Explain how the hell you did it. I don't know. A smile broke over my face. My heartbeat rammed faster. I reached out and brushed the marks with my fingertips, brushed them softly as I might stroke a cat. The swirling line work felt cool against my fingertips. Lovely, delicate lines, tangled and stretched tight atop the bricks. God, this is so cool. I did this. I am so cool. Right, said Daisy. Look sideways. Jing struck a pose like she was praying, fingertips pressed together, palms parallel, expression hard as the walls or the floor. Her voice was sweet and buttery. When I invited you to do your witch thing, I was expecting something small. I was going to let you wiggle your fingers and say something rhymy and weird. Hell, I thought it wouldn't even work, but you're creepy and I figured that having you here would put people in the Halloween mood. This, I was not expecting all this. Is that your way of staying in band from all your future house parties? I leaned against the wall, shoulder to my accidental masterpiece. The stupid, giddy grin was here to stay. My face kind of hurt from smiling this hard. Good. Jing looked me in the face, her gaze lasering through my skull. She grinned with teeth. Are you kidding? I nearly got my scare party trending and it's only the third. Everyone is talking about it. Conversation Monday morning will be strictly about the baddest haunted house ever. I cocked a brow. You're giving me whiplash. Look, I'm pissed because there's chalk all over my goddamn basement. You're staying the night and helping me clean up. My parents come home on Tuesday, and it needs to be spotless by then. I'm not pissed because of the magic. I just want to know how you did it. I want in. My mind flashed to Madeline again. My smile slipped a little. If the casting worked, then what had happened with her? I shoved my hands into my pockets and stared at my shoes. There was a crumpled leaf stuck in the laces. The gap from midnight till now was starting to leave a strange taste in my mouth. Did you see Madeline? For a chance. Madeline? Like the extra chick in the circle? No. Jing snaked her hand through her hair. Why? She wanted to see how it worked, too. She dragged me upstairs, and we sat on the deck, and she was insistent about it. Not that I minded. I liked showing off. Something struck me when we were out there, and I felt this sort of zinging queasiness, the sort that always comes with magic. So maybe I recklessly jumped into it. It was a huge rush, but I blamed the alcohol for that. I didn't think about it. I mean, it shouldn't have worked. I drew a five-pointed circle, and Yates broke the circle, so the spell should have died. I don't know how the two of us could have done all this. I really don't remember. I jammed my tongue in my cheek. I tried to rewind the tapes in my head, but it was like there wasn't a gap at all. Inhale at midnight, exhale at noon. We found you on the deck, just you, though. Madeline must have left, Jing said. Do you have her number? Daisy yowled and clapped her hands. Not like that. I rolled my eyes so hard they nearly fell out of my head. I'm just saying that she might not know what happened. Uh, but she might. I, I'm plenty curious myself, believe it or not. Admittedly, the Daisy line of thought was also appealing. A significant part of me wanted to buy Madeline coffee. All the coffee in the damned world, even if she had, left me on a freezing deck. Oh, wait, maybe not then. God damn it. I clawed the hair off my forehead and cringed at how stringy it felt. I don't. I barely know her. She came with someone else. Jing stood beside me and kicked and rocked back against the wall. Her hair, tousled and bleached, 
fell in a jagged fringe across her forehead, and the way it frayed around her collarbone was the stuff of daydreams. If she had told me she spent the morning at the beach, I would have believed her. Random, I said mostly to myself. But your hair looks mega kick-ass, just thought you should know. I scuffed the sole of my boot against the cement. When I do the messy hair thing, I look like a junkie. Thanks, said Jing. She blinked, and something like a smile twitched on her cheeks. And you always look like a junkie. It just kind of works on you. Right. I took a cursory scan of the room and cleared my throat. I have no idea what any of these lines mean, like any of them. It makes zero sense. I can't believe I'm asking this, but what did the actual spell do? Like, what were you trying to do when we were all holding hands? Daisy was sizing up the St. Sebastian heart doodle. Because I've seen the craft like six times, and they never drew hearts on stuff. I don't really know what I was trying to do. I just kind of did it. I don't normally draw hearts and shit, but it doesn't really matter what you draw so long as you believe it. I mean, there's got to be a circle, but like you can draw, scribble like a five-year-old with lipstick on a wall and it'll still work as long as your incantation doesn't suck. Actually, no. It barely ever works, and when it does, it can usually be debunked by killjoy skeptics on the internet, and that's when I'm following spellbook advice to the letter. This was absurd. I didn't draw any of these on purpose, so there wasn't any intention to drive them. And it wasn't like I had had a hell of a lot of intention in the first place. I was trying to make the lights flicker. Something simple, flashy, manageable. These sigils shouldn't have been capable of this. I cracked my knuckles, click, 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 but my left ring finger was stuck uncracked and it took a substantial amount of willpower not to snap at trying. My mood ring smudged green, thinking hurt. Hey, Jane, can I see that video you took? There's got to be something in there. Yeah. Jane pulled out the latest iPhone from nowhere and fluttered her fingertips across the screen. She gave me a tight little smirk and thrust it in my direction. The quality, for a shitty phone recording, was remarkable. The bass was distorted, but the laughter and the off-key singing sounded genuine. Glow splotchy bodies writhed in on themselves. When the chalk drawings rippled into existence, floating bodies, floating like bodies to the brick wall surface, the music cut out then skidded back with an old final crackle. A scream tore through the crowd and dark shadows, only people shaped with the neon splatters lit them up, threw themselves on top of each other as they scrambled toward the stairs. Jing's voice, jagged as glass, carved through the crowd. Bet you losers thought we couldn't scare you. The angle fell crooked and blacked out. I watched it three times. I have no idea what I did, I said, but holy hell, I did a damn good job of it, I'd say. Daisy yawned, stretched on releve. She folded her arms behind her head. You should come to our parties more often. Jing, I'm inviting Sideways to all our parties. Nah, 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 nothing you can do about it. Sideways pig at all of our parties. Can you imagine? Yikes, all right. My stupid crooked smile fell off, but I crossed my arms and made like I hadn't heard her. I just materialized magic chicken scratch on Jing Gao's walls without trying to. Daisy would have to rack up a lot more nasty to phase me at this point. Give me my phone back. I uncrossed my arms long enough to hand it over and then promptly resumed my stance. Right, said Jing as she pocketed her phone and rocked back on her heels. Whatever. Look, I wasn't sure what point I was trying to make, but a nagging voice in my head said I was the wrong one. I cleared my throat. I can try to revamp that spell, reverse engineer it or something. I can show you how I did it in the first place. Us plus Yates and Madeline pack quite the supernatural punch. No way we couldn't recreate this. Hell, we can make it bigger. I wager we could do a lot more than party tricks. We could do something really cool. Something cool. A horrible, tantalizing fantasy swam up in my mind's eye. The four of us in a clique, strutting meanly in lockstep in matching jackets. Our nails sharp, our lips dark, our heels clacking in tandem with our heartbeats. The unholy trinity alchemizing into a quartet. I imagined us shocking people speechless. They'd look at us like we were teenage araignées, like we were untouchable. I felt ill and giddy imagining it, imagining Yates and Jing and Daisy wanting to be near me, wanting to talk to me and be close to me. Best friends like the movies. Jing's phone exploded. Her phone was at its peak volume, and the ringing was so jarring that I jumped. She sighed, rolled her eyes, and declined the call. It's just Yates, she said to Daisy. She flickered her focus back to me. So, if you think we can do that again, I'm in. Nothing is cool in this town. And that was cool. Bring it. We can, God damn it, she said. Her phone lit up again. The ringer blasted. Jing scowled, swiped, cradled it to her ear. Daisy and I exchanged silent question marks. What the fuck? 
Slow down, start over. Someone was sobbing on the other side. I can't understand you, babe, what's wrong? The sobbing grew louder. What do you mean in the pool? You're talking nonsense. Okay, okay, I'll get it. I'll come see the pool. Hush, I know. The pool? Daisy looked ravenous. Like, as in your pool? Jing shot a seething glance in Daisy's direction, but she nodded nonetheless. Daisy looked lupine. She grabbed me by the wrist and bounced from foot to foot. Come on, sideways. If it's gremlins, you can witch them to death. She dragged me back toward the stairs. Daisy held my hand differently than Madeline had. Tighter grip, almond nails poised to prick. Her hands were softer. Even so, the similarity made me royal. Cold sweat on the back of my neck. I let her pull me across the threshold. I heard Jing, still whispering on her phone at my heels. We trekked through the party ruins, through the black balloons, through the deck door, past the place where my skull had smacked, down the rickety stairs. We crossed the lawn and weaved between the flamingos. We stopped precariously close to the edge of the pool, toes on the rim, and peered over the edge of the cavernous turquoise hole below. It went down and down and down. My stomach flipped. There were bodies at the bottom. Four slender bodies, two does and a fawn, lay dead in the deep end of the pool. Neck stretched, eyes dull. Their legs stuck out at stiff angles. There were no bullet holes or cherry splatters. Their insides were not out. It was just the stillness, the inexplicable, sickening stillness. Their bodies were arranged in neat rows. The bottom doe, the bigger of the two, had her head to the left and her tail to the right, and the middle doe was arranged in the opposite fashion. The fawn, still milky speckled, was stretched like the first doe, left to right. The fourth body, curled up next to the fawn, was Yates, her phone still cradled to her cheek. And then there's another chapter. Amazing. Um, I also love that by, by the fact that I'm following Clark to all of his events this week means that I've now gotten most of the first chapter. <laughs> like, read to me. <laughs> so, I love it. I'm so excited for my, my pre-order. I just got a shipping notification, so I'm excited. Wow, oh, so exciting. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so um, yeah, so we've decided we're going to do Q&A uh, after both of the readers go. Um, so feel free to pop your questions in at any time and we'll uh, go through and, and catch, catch up on them then. Um, but for right now, we are super psyched to introduce our uh, second reader, Zoraida Cordova, um, is the author of many fantasy novels, including Star Wars, A Crash of Fate, the Brooklyn Bruja series, and Incendiary. Her novel Labyrinth Lost won an International Latino Book Award in 2017. Her short fiction has appeared in the New York Times bestselling anthology Star Wars from a Certain Point of View and Toil and Trouble, 15 Tales of Women and Witchcraft. She is the co-editor of Vampires Never Get Old, a YA anthology forthcoming from I uh, Imprint Macmillan in fall 2020. Uh, Zoraida was born in um, Guayaquil, Ecuador and raised in Queens, New York. Uh, thank you so much for bringing both the witchy and the vampire Empiric energy today. That's very Thank, you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be able to do this. Um, so I'm actually going to be reading from my short story, which is in Vampires Never Get Old. Um, it's very glossy. Uh, so I'm one of the editors uh, of this anthology, along with Natalie C. Parker, the author of Sea Fire, and it is. 11 stories full of vampire vampire tales, but we're sort of remixing the vampire myth and making it a little bit uh, queer and browner. So that's what this entire anthology, I'm just gonna undress this really quickly so it's easier to read from. Um, my story is also co-written with Natalie and look at the spine. And uh, it is called Vampires Never Say Die. And it's about two future best friends um, and we're trying to figure out what does what does forever mean when you're when you're uh, having an immortal friendship. So what is what is the new meaning of forever uh, between two friends? And it's uh, between a girl named a two hundred year old vampire named Brittany and a human girl named Theo. And so the backstory is Theo is throwing a party, a surprise party for Brittany, and Brittany who doesn't want to hurt Theo because she's human is backing out. And so it goes back and forth between them. I'm writing Theo, who is a young Ecuadorian girl like myself. Um, okay. So it's interspersed with text messages between them, which is how they got to know each other via Instagram. And so I'll start with that. <clears throat> Theo, OMG, love this filter. Where'd you find it? Brittany, 
it's my vampire filter, Theo. I know you're joking, but do you ever think about what it would be like to live forever? Brittany, sounds lonely. Theo Linda, I honestly don't know how I'm going to outdo myself. I say to the empty room, the Root and Ruin nightclub basement lounge is my masterpiece, truly. Black velvet curtains hang from the wall, the mahogany bar, which was previously covered in cobwebs that rivaled those in my attic, gleams with polish and lavender scented mistoline. Although maybe cobwebs would have worked thematically. Oh well, there's always next year. A guy in black leather cowboy hat, a velvet vest, and jeans so ripped they don't even count as pants, walks in. Hey. I'm DJ, Hex marks the spot. I bite my lower lip to stop from laughing. My eyes my eyes must be bugging out and I can't afford to mess up the eyeliner that took me three times to apply. Old guys are so gross. Mm-hmm, so that's not just your handle online. Okay, okay, okay. I'm Theo, you can set up near the bar. Remember, no pop, no 70s or 80s unless it's exclusively Led Zeppelin. I bite the tip of my pointed nails. My gel manicure is white, but the end of each nail looks as though it was dipped in blood. Hey, I thought it was clever, even if obvious. Although, I tell him, I'm not really sure what Brittany listens to, so she likes my music updates, but usually the lady rock variety. You know what? You're the pro, just do your thing. When DJ, I will never ever repeat his real name, flashes a smile, his teeth seem too white and sharp for a second. I am the pro. Imogen recommended me, right? Yeah, I, I, I say. Then I got you, baby bird. I laugh nervously. You do that, and I'll go make sure we have ice. I unlock my phone and shoot off a series of messages. I had to invite my friend Miriam from school because her dad owns the club, but she's nursing strep throat that she caught from Andy Jackson the third. It was extremely hard to explain to Miriam who this surprise birthday party was for. She was all like, vampires are so 2005. I have a very detailed scrapbook of the time we went to the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part Two Midnight Premiere from fifth grade that says she once thought otherwise. I tell her to feel better, then pull up her dad's last text message. I assure Mr. Greenspan that everything is under control and the adult doorman and bartender have arrived. They haven't, actually. But it's early. Mr. Greenspan owns four nightclubs and bars on the Lower East Side. The Root and Ruin is the least popular one, which is probably why he let me have the basement bar, which is pretty much unfinished and has that New York smell of cement, mold, and a dash of pee. But black velvet fabric stapled to the walls make it, makes it look like the vampire den I dreamed of Britney having. I rip open a plastic bag of vampire teeth and spread them um, around the bar. As the DJ dims the lights, some of them glow in the dark. The bartender arrives, a surly guy who looks like Oscar Isaac. If Oscar Isaac had been dipped in the same vat of radioactive whatever that turned the Joker's hair green. You the boss, Nina? Only my dad calls me Nina, I say, and he laughs. I'm Theo. He shakes my hand. My dad always taught me to look someone in the eye and never be the first person to let go. I wish I could implement that at my school with teachers who seem to look through me. Then again, my dad comes from the generation of immigrants who think that everything is fair if you just work hard and die for it. Even if you're undervalued and underpaid. Me, I have dreams, big ones. A solid handshake can't hurt, I guess. Listen, the doorman flaked, Latino Joker says, scratching the tattoo on his left bicep. Want me to call Mr. Greenspan? Actually, I hold up my phone. My dad also taught me never to lie, never steal, never sin. I failed catechism for a reason, but there are some things my Ecuadorian dad can't teach me. Not in this city, not in this school, and definitely not in this bar. I was just messaging with Mr. Greenspan and he said everything is cool. With that settled, I turn my attention to the finishing touches. A rusty candelabra hangs precariously from the low ceiling. It looks like a safety hazard, something out of a haunted mansion. Using a stepladder, I plunk 
battery operated tea lights into each candle holder. When I'm finished, I step back. The ceiling makes a strange groaning sound and I hold my breath for a second, waiting for it to come crashing down, but it doesn't, not yet. <laughs> the DJ kicks off the music, something with heavy bass and deep guitar. Now I have, now I've outdone myself, I say. You sure have, says a young woman I recognize right away. She has the kind of ice blonde hair that reminds me of a cotton swab. She's got killer cheekbones and lips that would make most makeup tutorials accounts jealous. Her dress is all lace, like on the cover of this really old record my mom has of some woman named Stevie Nicks. There's a white lace choker around her slender throat and she walks like someone who is used to owning a room. That's the pose I've tried so hard to capture in my photos. Sure, I get 4,000 likes just standing by the Brooklyn Bridge with the background, but I definitely don't own anything the way Imogen does. I will someday. You must be Imogen, I say, and lower my voice. I'm Theo, glad you got my invite. We're just getting started. Aren't you adorable? She's about five foot seven, just shy of being taller than me. Her eye color looks a little unreal, a marbled blue and hazel. My whole body tenses when she gets five inches from me. I have the immediate instinct to take several steps back, but you know what? I've gone to Catholic school and private school my whole life. I have seen meaner, richer, bitchier girls, and I stay put. I spin in my black baby doll dress. It's a little over the top and tighter than the cheap online picture promise, but I was going for a more Wednesday Adams look. Thanks. I'll, I like the look. Very retro, I say. For the first time, I notice another group of women standing around us. How did they get here so quietly? Three brunettes and three redheads with skin so white, it looks like it could glow in the dark, like the fake teeth at the bar. One of the girls picks up a pair, a pear and jams it into her mouth. She nearly doubles over with la laughter. I'm curious, Imogen says, tapping her finger on her chin. How did you and Brit Brittany meet? It's hard to explain to someone that I met one of my best friends on the internet. My mom doesn't understand why I spend so much time on my phone, why I can't ha just have friends in my neighborhood or at school other than Miriam. There's always been something that doesn't click for me. It looks like it's, it's like looking at photos of myself might help me figure out who I really am. I know some things. I'm the daughter of Ecuadorian immigrants. I am a straight A student. I'm gonna take the world by storm someday, somehow. And when I love people, I will ride or die. That's why I have such few friends. Brittany was a happy accident. Sometimes she'll say the things I'm feeling without me having to explain myself. Sometimes she lets me vent about Jenny Gustafson writing nasty names on my gym locker and then threatens to have her taken care of. That's what this whole party is about, thanking Brittany because she won't even take the time to pamper herself. She's in college and all she does is take pictures on days when it's dark and rainy. Hashtag Vampstagram is our inside joke. And this Imogen and her friends might laugh at it, but I think this party is the best idea I've ever had. So when she asks how Brittany and I met, I shrug and say, around, she's so secretive though. You're literally the only person who's ever tagged her in a photo. Yeah, she's camera shy. Imogen sh sashays over to the bar and winks at me. Come have a drink. My mom is the best hostess I know. She spends all day making food and rice and potato salad and and alcohol never passes her lips. I'm not my mother. And we drink the bloody mimosas I came up with. As the music thrums, making the walls and ceiling vibrate, candelabra, more people pour in, more women who've powdered their skin the shade of death. One woman in a, is in a lime green dress and, and platform shoes. She leads an older, an older woman by a leash and takes a cushioned seat. Okay, that's new. Maybe she thought it was one of those kinky bars and or whatever they're called. She brushes the woman's hair back and exposes her neck. They look like the time Ricky Martinez and I had to pretend kiss when we were Maria and Tony in our school's rendition of West Side Story. 
A white girl who must be younger than me shoves a cigarette in her mouth. She looks like an extra from a Blink-182 music video. Ugh, she says, I remember when the city was alive. Okay, these guests are very weird, but they are Britney's friends. I dive deeper into the club where people seem to have multiplied. A couple of women are making out on the love seats. Red wine is spilled on some of the nap napkins. Should I have gotten black napkins for this very reason? I change my trajectory and go onto the front of the bar where three young guys who look like they took a wrong turn from Williamsburg are clustered. Is this, is this BYOB? One of them asks, bringing out a flask from the pocket of his flannel shirt. What does he mean, bring your own booze? There's literally a full open bar. They catch sight of me standing near them and one smiles. He's the youngest of the three with dark eyes and cr close cropped hair, like he just got out of boot camp. Are you new? He asks, slightly confused. Not any more than you are, I say. I don't want to make a big deal that I'm actually two months shy of graduating high school. Where's the guest of honor anyway? One of the one with the handlebar mustache asks. I've got a bone to pick with her. She's got to loosen the reins on this vampire curfew. You're telling me, the guy mutters. His muscles flex when he takes the flask from his friend. He doesn't drink though. I know Imogen is still pissed, but that's another story, he says. Imogen wants to turn every model that catches her eye. That's why she didn't sign the petition. Why, you guys are really into this vampire RPG stuff, I say. I'm about to shoot Brittany a text when her name lights up my screen. I reread the line where she says that she's not gonna make it. And I know that is unacceptable. I text her back without looking and pocket my phone. The guy with the crew cut looks at me with a suspicious curiosity. He grins and it gives him the appearance of a wolf. Do you want some, he asks. Do I want a drink out of a flask from a strange but objectively hot boy at a party where I'm the hostess and the guest of honor hasn't shown up or texted me back yet? I grab it and drink. The liquid is warm, slightly thick, metallic, and I feel my gag reflex at work. Blood. That's definitely 100% blood. The tiniest sip pools on my tongue and dribbles down the corner of my mouth. Before I can wipe it off, the boy drags his thumb along my chin and brings it to his lips. Gross. When he smiles again, taking the flask, the flask back, I see teeth. Not the neon canines decorated, decorating the bar. Real sharp ones. So sharp, I know they'd break skin at the barest touch. Maybe. Just maybe Brittany wasn't lying. Maybe, just maybe, I'm in the center of a basement full of vampires. And that's where I'll stop. There's a bunch of more sections to go, but that is the introduction to Theo Linda in Vampires Never Say Die, which is in Vampires Never Get Old coming out on Tuesday, September 22nd. So, yay. So rad. Oh my god. God, how <laughs> cool to stop there. <laughs> I feel like I would have gotten into that kind of shenanigans as a teenager, just accidentally thrown a birthday party and then have it be a birthday party full of um, vampires. <laughs> yeah, I mean, is this the there's type of shenanigans we're supposed to stop getting into as an adult? Because I'm not sure that I fully learned that lesson. <laughs> I'm just about to say that that was awesome and the readings were awesome. And okay, I'm going to go away now. Um, oh, but if folks want to ask questions, put them in the chat. Yeah, you can stay for yeah. Q&A, Marty, if you want to. Uh, oh, uh, maybe in a bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yay, I see some. Okay, so I haven't seen anything that I that uh, struck me as a question yet, but I saw a lot of um, uh, Stevie Nicks appreciation. Uh, or I love it. About <laughs> appreciation. Um, lots of uh, general uh, clapping at things, remarks about our uh, New York City clubbing pasts. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe. I mean, any, any club in the village, I feel, would have been... Uh, I've always like lift like lifted the toilet seat with like my with my shoe. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, I was remarking on YouTube that just like remember the sentimental old days when in the club the only thing that we had to worry about is that the bathroom might be gross. <laughs> <sighs> I love it. 
Oh, okay. So there's a question from Kayla. Uh, how many stories are in Vampires Never Get Old? Uh, there are 11 stories in total. There's stories by Danielle Clayton, who is here somewhere in the chat. Uh, Mark Ashiro, Victoria Schwab slash V.E. Schwab uh, wrote a queer Romeo and Juliet vampire story. Rebecca Roanhorse. Um, just so many great authors. It's it's a it's a really uh, this is collection. Natalie and I came up with it when we were floating in a pool two years ago in the Alabama coast during a writer's retreat. And I, we were talking with a group of friends and we, I said something like, do you know what I miss? Vampires. <laughs> um, and then we were like, yeah, let's put this anthology together. And our friend, Julie Murphy, who was in the pool with us, she's the author of Dumplin'. I don't know if you guys, uh, in, you know, Dumplin' the movie uh, slash book, um, she was like, I want to write a fat vampire story. And we were like, yes. So um, we just wanted to make sure that the anthology represented lots of different people. There's a Daisy, Daisy vampire story. Um, it's all, everything's so amazing. That's awesome. Um, I start, and what was the date again for people that whose dates fall September out? 22nd. September 22nd, excellent. So it comes out this coming Tuesday. I'm so, it's been so long. <laughs> Yeah, uh, vampires are back in a big way. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. like, as a, uh, a person, I think I started my publishing career when I was getting tons of vampire submissions and they stopped for a while and now I'm getting tons of submissions again. So. Yeah. It's a renaissance. It is the vampire renaissance. <laughs> Clark, are you done with your sequel? Uh, I'm done. With <laughs> so I'm waiting on an edit letter. Okay. I'm not, I'm not here. <laughs> um. Oh. There you go. My bad. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, it, it's not going to be a very involved edit letter. The sequel is great. I just we just need to like like little things, like editing things. Um, I I am working on the third one right now. I'm by working on. I mean I am like starting the third one right now. Um, and it's 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 weird. It's it's weird to go back to Sideways's voice when I am not 19 and instead am 23 and have a better grip on my anger and trauma than sideways does. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird, like, I, I feel like a, a thing that I was not prepared for is like, if you publish young, then you like grow up and your voice is like kind of a time capsule. So. Yeah, weird. no, I, I feel that. How old are you? I'm 23 now. Yeah. I, I sold my first novel when I was 23. So it's been a decade. Uh, for me, and I, I reread passages from my first book, which is now out of print, and and I'm like, oh my god, I was such a baby. <laughs> but I I I do think that my voice was so raw back then. I was just like all emotion, and and now I sort of feel like I've I've taken a step back from myself. Um, but I, I, you're you're absolutely right. It is a, a time capsule of your voice. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, I think we're very lucky that we get to have like both of your voices from so many many decades of your lives. Hopefully, we'll get get to watch as you go through your twenties and thirties and forties, etc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, cool. Uh, so we had uh, we had a comment that Vampire Renaissance is the name of Esoteric Illusion's next rock band, um, and then a question from Sneha in the same vein: What monsters that aren't majorly in the public consciousness do you wish were? To question for both of you. Oh boy, I think about this all the time. All the time. As like uh, Emily Duncan online would call it, calls it m monster fucking like. <laughs> Just obsessing, thirsting over like over <laughs> monsters. Um, I would say gargoyles. <laughs> just want to figure out. Yes, Gargi from a song "Below Water" by Bethany C. Morrow. Um, that reignited my gargoyle obsession. Uh, I feel like the TV show Gargoyles, and I watched it, was like my sexual awakening. Uh, just seeing Goliath break from his stone shell into his wingspan. That was great. <laughs> I feel like my question is, like, this isn't quite what was being asked, but I, 
the, the <laughs> specific type of vamp, like monster matters less to me than monsters being girls. Um, like monster boyfriends are having a moment. There are plenty of people who will uh, endlessly praise the monster boyfriend stories in their life. And I'm into those stories, but why aren't women monstrous and gross and hard to comprehend? Um, I, I would be, I would, I would be here for a plethora. Of have you boys. read, have you read Nightshine by Tessa Grattan? Not yet. There's a, there's a character called, named uh, the sorceress, the sorceress who eats girls. <laughs> Noted. Okay. <laughs> it just came out. You should buy it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Your chalice is so much cooler than my big mason jar. I mean, I just, I stay ready with my aesthetics. Like Theolinda in my vampire short story. Mm. Are all about aesthetics, I guess. <laughs> I'm interested in the fact that both of our story, like that Theo's at a birthday party in a mm -hmm. club and that partying is so important in Skate Racers and the scene of like the club space or the party space as not just a queer thing, but kind of like this like alternative socialization space where weird genre stuff happens. Like how many genre play stories start in clubs or parties? Actually, I was talking about this. So Natalie and I have a podcast that goes with Vampires Never Get Old where we discuss each, um, we talk to each author and, uh, and sort of discuss like, why do this? Why vampires? And we started off reading the early 1990s vampire fiction in the Forest of the Night by Amelia Atwater Rhodes. Um, uh, not Vivian, yeah, I think it was Vivian Vandeville, not Vi Annette Curtis Claus, uh, The Silver Kiss. And a, a lot of these vampire books have some sort of uh, supernatural club, right? And and I think that it it just, it, it becomes a showpiece, right, of power. I'm here, Imogen shows up in my story. She's like the challenging, you know, vampire lady. And she shows up and she's here to confront another vampire, even though it's her birthday party. Um, and Theo is just a hapless girl. Um, but for her, parties also symbolize uh, the opportunity to show herself and to showcase what she can do. Um, and I think that that's really interesting, specifically in the YA space, uh, because parties are just this, this social thing um, where you, you're, they're always like where the, the, um, the climax of something is, um, where you get to see everyone's big moments, either their hopes and dreams either come true or are completely dashed. Um, so that's interesting. I, I feel that as well. Oh, Julia just pointed at companions of the night. Yep. Isn't there a vampire club in blade? I'm sure. Like with blood sprinklers? Or did I invent this memory? <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah, my first was um, Lost, the Lost Soul series by Poppy, at the time, Poppy Z. Bright, uh, Billy Martin. Mm -hmm. I think that there's club scenes in that as well, though, like it's been a long time. There's club scenes in Buffy. There's club scenes in The Shadow Hunters um, by Cassandra Clare. It's just, you know, on and on. I think it's just a staple. And mm -hmm. I, I love them. I love I love a good supernatural club. For sure. I mean, it's also at least thinking with gay racers. Like I think of the club as as a queer teenager, like the first place you sneak out to experience being queer among other queers. Mm -hmm. This place that is supposedly allegedly intended for you. Yeah. Um, one yeah. thing that I liked about both of our stories is that so obviously mine's Ours is only, you know, like 7,000 words, but um, there is this thread of loneliness and um, your care sideways is, uh, she's not lonely, but she's an outcast, mm -hmm. right? And so the the supernatural is such a great metaphor for the, the other in some ways. And um, obviously Theo is, very peppy and 
you know, not the kind of person who who like ever thought she would become a vampire um, because she has so much left to live, right? She wants to do big things, but obviously something's gonna happen at the end of the story. Um, and, but we're, we're, we have like girls on the verge of something bigger and uh, how do you feel writing in that in that YA space where you are on the brink of something? You're on the brink of finding your found family. You're on the brink of understanding your big magic. You're on the brink of so much stuff. Yeah, I mean, like being a young adult, particularly because both of these characters are seniors, right? Mm -hmm. like, you're also on the brink of being in a radically different social situation and suddenly being an adult, theoretically, even though you're not. Um, and like sideways is, I think more lonely than sh she would like to let on, at least in the first chapter. Uh, and there, there's a, a scariness that is well mediated by bigger, flashier, scarier things than personal scariness. Um, like it's easier to offset your own baggage onto the big supernatural happenings that are going on in your life that it is to grapple with your own uh perhaps more terrifying but less glamorous perils yeah um so you might have inadvertently just answered like part of Julia's question, but it ties in well. Um, I, I love um, how in Scapegracers, you kind of subvert the Mean Girls trope by not having any drama within the clique. Why did you choose to make their conflict uh, external instead of between them? Um, I find, so I love girl clique movies a lot. Like I love The Craft and I love Jawbreaker and I love Heathers and I love Mean Girls proper. Um, and all of those movies, like focus on the dissolution of the clique. Like they always fall apart, usually pretty violently. Um, mm -hmm. And the girls are paranoid and catty and uh, destroy each other, sometimes physically. And it felt, as much as I love those movies, like a thing that I wasn't interested in repeating as we mm -hmm. bring the clique into the future. I'm far more interested in girls like collaborating and caring about each other and uh, looking at the actual source of their problems, which is usually not each other, right? Like it's either structural or it's people who are interpersonally pulling up stuff that is structurally implicit. Um, yeah, like I just, I am bored by the notion of stories where girls who are friends stop being friends and that's the triumph. That's just, that's sad and I don't, that's not what I want for sideways. Yeah, I like that. I think that the inversion of YA tropes is something that we really need to get more of. Um, I love, I love tropes. Like I'm, I'm a romance author. I am a fantasy author, and and I live for a good trope. But I also think that the the thing that makes us come back to certain stories, even though they're familiar, is that is that inversion of something, right? That unexpected. Uh, this is familiar, but look at this twist. And so for us, for Natalie and myself, we wanted to take the um, being with somebody forever, right? The the insta, uh, insta love, but make it platonic and make it between two friends because there's no story with two, two girl vampires, right? Friends that they're, you know, they just chill and <laughs> hang out in New York and, and, and have like a good uh, buddy cop romp. Uh, and and that so this is their inception. This is their their meet cute. Their best friends, best friends forever, literally. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, it's it's just the beginning for for Theo and 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 Brittany. Uh, I love that. Um, we had a question for uh, another fresh question from Kayla. Uh, do all the vampires in the anthology follow the same rules, like the stereotypes that they can't go in sunlight or hate garlic, etc.? Uh, not all of the vampires know, uh, for the most part. So for instance, there's a short story called the handbook for the newly sired Daisy vampire, which is, uh, written by Samira Ahmed. And it is literally like an app, like a guidebook, um, mar uh, t written for you're a Daisy kid. Who's just been turned into a vampire. What do you do now? Right? Like most of us are vegetarians. What do you do? Like we don't even hurt flies. Um, if you're Sikh, right? And so it's 
it's it's it's sort of answering all of those questions like what happens if you're not a white cis head dude you know getting turned in uh medieval europe <laughs> uh and then there's Danielle clayton's vampire story the house of the black sapphires which is, um, it sort of poses the question of what va black vampires look like if um, white slave owning vampires might have bitten their, um, their slaves and, and turned them into vampires. And so they sort of break off because of segregation, they would have created their own vampire tree, right? Their own vampire uh, branch of the, the vampire tree. And, and so what does that look like? It's set in New Orleans and it is, if you want, you know, New Orleans vampires with black protagonists, this is it, like, this is the story. Um, so we sort of take uh, different approaches, everyone takes a different approach to the vampire myth. And that was the whole point of it. We, we sort of challenged everyone uh, by saying, we obviously didn't say hate, right? Your marginalization, right? Like, um, but people wanted to address that because I think we've all been waiting for that opportunity. One of uh, my favorite, one of the my favorite stories in the anthology is by Kayla Whaley, uh, who has a vampire in a wheelchair. And what does that look like when vampirism has always been treated like a magical cure, and now it isn't? So, so rad, so rad. Okay, um, so um, we had a question from uh, Ronsonized, um, uh, which is a question for both of you to name one YA author you'd like to collaborate with that you haven't yet. Oh boy. Okay, so. <laughs> so many. Um, you go first. Uh, okay. Um, this is, not really a serious answer and instead it's like an emotional answer but uh like spiderwick came out when i was little and learning how to read Aww. so i've been reading holly black since i could read um Aww. so it would be really cool to write with holly black because uh, there is no writing for me without holly black so holly black. i i feel you holly was one of my when i first read time um i I had this moment of, oh, we can make fairy tales modern. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, and then that sort of started my urban fantasy obsession. So I 100% I feel you. Do you like Coldest Girl in Cold Town? Oh, I love it. It's such a good vampire <laughs> book. Oh book. my God. I have a Holly Black shelf. It's just Holly, all of Holly's books. <laughs> Um, yeah, like everything she's ever written is up there. <laughs> um, I think for me, obviously I've collaborated with Natalie Parker. Uh, I'd love to collaborate with Danielle Clayton because she's one of my best friends. We, I mean, we already have a podcast together called Deadline City for so like a writing podcast, but you know, never know. Um, maybe I just, I mean, I, I admire so many authors, uh, you know, Lee Bardugo, V Schwab, um, Shamila Mendez um, is a fabulous um, YA author. Uh, she just had a book come out called Furia, which is Bend It Light Beckham, but uh, set in Argentina. And uh, Nina Moreno is another author whom I really love. Um, she wrote a book called Don't De Rosa Santos. So I just like, you know, there's so many authors. Oh, can't. Uh. That's awesome. That is both great lists. Um, uh, Melinda said, I, I bet she'd do it. I think this was a reference to uh, to Holly Black. She's so nice and it's true. She's one of the like golden kingdoms of, of our world, as I'm sure many of these other people are. I just don't know them as well personally. <laughs> uh, Cool. So I'm. Uh, I know we're running a few minutes ahead of the YouTube view, but I haven't seen any questions, and we're pretty close to the time that we usually end. Um, There's one any... from Clark, I think. Oh. Um, oh, wait, did we answer that already? Um, I, yeah, I think there was the one about the Mean Girls oh, trip. Yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, do, you, do you have any last thoughts or questions for each other or things you want to close with? Um, what is something you want readers to take away from your story? Mm. I think with the first book, I want... 
I would like it if readers took away that they can trust things like friendship on the page. Like I'm mm -hmm. not, I, I am not a, I think the, the goth thing can fool people. I'm a big softie and I don't particularly like meanness in narratives. <laughs> I'm not really interested in bamboozling my readers. I'm not particularly interested in like pulling something out from underneath of them to make them feel stupid for, for caring about friendship in books um, because it's important to me. So yeah, I, I, I hope I form a little bit of trust with, with my readers and trust in uh, girls caring about each other. Mm -hmm. That's rad. Um, Clark, oh, sorry, we had one more quick question for you, which was what color would your specter be? Oh man. Uh, well, oh boy. I, you would think that I had ever thought about this before and I never have. Um, I'm surprised by that. I, um, and Zoretta, you can jump in on the game if there's like a question that you think your magic would manifest, uh, excuse me, a color that you think your magic would manifest as. Yeah. Probably pink. Pink? That's great. <laughs> rose think, gold. Millennial rose pink. Gold That's pretty rad. I think maybe like a, like a very, very pale, like purpley blue color. Yeah. As Excellent. much as I want to be like, I'm so dark, or whatever. No, I'm a pink marshmallow. That's rad. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love it. Um, okay, if you what, question for you: If you could meet in real life a vampire that is like within the vampire canon, okay, but only for like an evening, like you can only like get coffee with this vampire. Like it cannot okay. pursue further. You will never see them again. Who would it be? Okay. Oh my God. So my mind is firing so quickly. <laughs> um, right. So the, honestly, the first person that came to mind was Damon Salvatore and not for like sexy reasons. Cause like he, you know, he's beautiful, but he belongs to Elena. Um, really because he's knows how to party and like, Another, my second answer would have been Angel, but Angel's too tortured and he would definitely not party. He'd be like, oh yeah, um, I'm just gonna creep around here and like in this coffee shop um, and be at the bronze but not dance. But Damon would be like, let's play pool. Let me show you how to do this. Let me tell you all these stories. Uh, let me cover 200 years of history and tell you exactly how things happen that are left out in textbooks. Um, yeah, so he would be dope. <laughs> all right, good answer. Excellent. All right. Awesome. Well, I think this is where I thank you both so much for reading for us, for answering questions kindly, uh, for hanging out. And it was like a really great conversation and great to see see us see see you see you hang and um uh we're super excited by uh the escape graces which is just out this week and by um uh, your anthologies right now, which is out uh next uh sorry the 22nd of september um uh marty do you want to do i guess closing honors since you've showed back up uh, yeah i just i just like to show back up to uh let everyone be able to sign off and then i'll close everything out but um Thank you so much, Zoraida. Thank you so much, Clark, for being here. Thank you, Liz, for hosting. Thank you for such a wonderful uh, Q&A and readings. The anthology sounds wonderful. The Escape Creations, as we know, is amazing. Um, if you haven't bought a copy yet, please go out and support your indie bookstores. I'm repping Book Moon from uh, Kelly uh, Link and Gavin Grant. But please, if you have an indie store, go out and go support them. If you need a link to the Discord, if you wanted to join us for our Erewhon Community Hour, um, you can email us at info at um, Just drop a line there. You should have it by now. And that's it for me. I think otherwise we will see you soon. We've got some good stuff coming up. Um, Clark has some other wonderful events coming up for the rest of their wonderful digital launch. Um, so you can catch them tomorrow night with Porter Square Books with Emily Duncan and Rory Power. And I think in your I own... Love them. Yep. <laughs> it, it is going to be just chaotic from what I understand. Even I don't know what's gonna happen and I set the event up. So uh, I think that's a good sign. Um, but thank you everybody for being here. Uh, Zoraida, thank you. Uh, Clark, thank you so much. Uh, Liz, thank you very much. And if there, if no one has any comments, I'll sign us all out and we'll see you over on the Discord. All right, thank you.
Awesome. Bye. Thank you guys. Take care now. Thank you for coming and uh, please follow us at arrowonbooks.com. Uh, follow us online, Twitter, uh, YouTube here, of course, Instagram, Facebook, Arrow One Books. And uh, we hope to see you again for future salons. Take care of yourselves, stay safe, stay healthy, and support indie bookstores.